Marvellous. Let me, um, I'm going to start a timer because I'm, I'm a notorious wanderer. Uh, my name's Andy Dobson. Um, I'm a creative technologist. I've been working in web for about 15 years. Um, and uh, first things first, actually, uh, the opinions of this speaker do not necessarily represent the opinions of B-Skype, um, because I might actually go a little bit off message tonight. Um, uh, because really what I want to talk about tonight is um, uh, kind of how I became to love my job again um, I, I, and really experienced some sense of wonder about uh, digital, about technology, about what I kind of do for a living. Um, so I came to be Skyby about five years ago, initially as a freelance Flash developer. Um, and uh, I built some of the uh, some of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the products that uh, Jim mentioned a, a minute ago. Um, and um, something really begins to strike you when you move from a creative environment into a very heavily corporate environment. Um, and that's this. Um, companies have an obsession with product. Um, this in and of itself is not actually unreasonable. Um, the business of any business is to monetize products and services. Um, and we do that to consumers, we do that to other businesses. Uh, uh, this is basically what we do for a living. Um, within, uh, 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 within the creative realm, um, this is essentially my job um, and the job of the very talented people with whom I work. Um, we support the product, we enhance the brand. Um, these uh, things are very important. Um, uh, in a minute, I'm going to talk about where the problems start coming in. And um, uh, uh, one of the kind of initial problems is that when you start having a very product-centered environment, um, the key measurement for your resource is productivity. Um, anyone who's worked in any form of major organization, not necessarily one in media, uh, will be very, very aware of these kind of words. These are words that just send shivers up my spine. Uh, KPIs, ROI, synergies. These things are actually not necessarily unreasonable. This is simply a language that business has developed so that it can communicate its concepts to one another internally within an organization. Um, you know, uh, having uh, an indication of the performance of your product is certainly not an unreasonable goal for a business. Um, what I began to kind of wonder, though, is that in a, a creative sense, when we're involved in something which is supposed to be experiential, um, and any media company um, is certainly about products and services, but it's also about uh, the, the, this kind of wider experience, and particularly in terms of, of entertaining an audience. Um, uh, these things don't really fit in with that. And I began to have a bit of a problem with finding really a kind of a, a, a way of expressing myself creatively. Um, part of that was to do with the fact that I'm a technologist. So my day-to-day -day work involves code, which, okay, some will argue that that's not a creative uh, pursuit. Um, I certainly don't agree with that, and hopefully I'll show you some things in a minute um, that will, will prove otherwise. This is the second problem, that um, when you start uh, getting it into in a, a product-centered environment, um, you put workflows and processes over it. That then becomes a production process. So this is a very typical production process for any creative agency. In fact, this isn't unique to B Sky B or even to large media corporations. Before I worked at Sky, I was a freelancer for many years. I worked for a lot of small creative agencies, independent creative agencies. Um, you know, even kind of some of the media startups that that uh, that, 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 um, that places like this uh, start will be very familiar. With with this kind of thing. Um, brief, pitch, client feedback, production, delivery. It's a workflow, it's, a, it's a, 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 something which you can measure your productivity against. Rinse, repeat. Um, <laughs> this slide's gonna get me into trouble. Um, so um, uh, this is one of the first things that I began to kind of really notice. In fact, there was a fantastic talk that I saw a few years ago uh, by an Irish uh, web development agency called Contrast um, that I've kind of slightly stolen this from. Um, uh, firstly, any UE-centric people um, that are in the room or, or IAs or anyone that's involved in this kind of thing, um, you know, I think actually there's a massive amount of benefit from UE, a massive amount of benefit from information architecture. We actually rely on that kind of information about what our users are doing uh, um, you know, to, to, to make sensible decisions, really, particularly as a technologist. I need uh, to, to do that before I commit huge resources into writing uh, uh, an awful lot of code. Um, one of the problems I started to have, though, was that um, the wireframe was a kind of key deliverable in that form. And so we were getting wireframes um, for every type of site that we would build, for every type of experience. And out of that, you can only have one thing, 
which is a homogenization of the content that you're creating. Hence, every new site more or less looks the same. In a world where media is changing as rapidly as it is now, I don't think you can actually afford to do that. Um, interestingly enough, one of the other kind of side things of UE is, is often to do a competitor research, actually not even necessarily UE so much, but certainly in terms of business analysis, they do competitor research. Another great point that Contrast made was that um, if you're doing competitor research um, or comparing yourself to other websites, seeing what else is out there in the market, what you're effectively doing is you're looking at what your competitors were doing six months ago. So really, where's the point in that? Um, uh, after a couple of years at Sky, um, my department, which was mostly involved in, in interactive products, uh, moved into Sky Creative. Sky Creative is a very large internal agency um, with some absolutely incredibly uh, talented people. And I began to get a little bit jealous because I was looking at what the promo department, for instance, were doing. And they were <laughs> making these absolutely stunning pieces of work. And in particular, what they were doing is they were being uh, not necessarily given the time, but part of their process was a free thinking, let's just get a piece of paper and a pencil and see uh, you know, what, 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 uh, what we can do with it. Um, and uh, I, I began to find this very inspiring and thought, well, why, why am I not making websites like this? You know, why am I not taking the same approach? There was a secondary thing as well, which is the development of my team. So I run a team of developers and, and uh, technology changes crazily fast right now. So, I mean, this is a dull slide, but this is basically all the stuff that I knew my developers coming into my team had to know about. I, I mean, really, where do you start with this? I, I can't send them all on training courses all the time. Um, um, not only were these specific technologies that we had to learn uh, or, or changes in technology, um, but also we were talking about emerging paradigms, which, um, you know, again, is something I'll show you in a minute. Um, uh, uh, actual changes in the way people relate to websites, people, uh, the changes in the way people use digital information. Um, things are moving really, really fast. This is my son. Um, son number two, more on son number one in a minute. Um, but really the rate of change in these things kind of almost frightens me a little bit. And um, it was um, fantastic seeing the, the, uh, the previous video, um, Sir Ken Robinson's um, thing talking about children and how they relate to the world and how there are some fundamental things that have to change. This isn't true, just true in education. This is also actually true in media. This is true in how people uh, relate to media. Earlier today, um, I did a workshop with um, a bunch of uh, college students, um, 16 to 18, I'm guessing. Um, and um, there's a question that I always like to ask when I speak to groups of that age, which is how many of you watch scheduled television? So how many of you watch House at 10 o'clock at night? Two people in a room of 50. Um, that's an astonishing paradigm change to the way that that generation consume media. And as a company, we obviously have to be very, very aware of that. Um, so how do we learn? Um, well, watching my two sons grow up it, it has been um, a fascinating experience for me because, and I think actually this is perhaps one of the most rewarding things I've found so far about being a parent, you actually get to see how human beings learn, how they relate to an environment. If you take out all of the kind of everyday stuff that we already know, um, you get to see how a blank mind works and um, um, it's an absolutely fascinating thing. Again, another point on that in a minute. Um, and so what I kind of started to, to think about was different ways of looking at the current tasks that we, we do. And basically putting that into what we would, I suppose, call research and development. Um, at Sky, we have formal research and development teams, obviously, just like any company. Um, uh, we do product development. Uh, often my department actually lends design resource to that as well. We even sometimes lend technology resource to it. But they are very product focused. Once again, they're talking about route to markets. They're talking about what are the next trends? Where is the next uh, sector opening up? Um, what we wanted to do is kind of really do it purely for the sake of, of, of the sheer joy of ripping these things apart and seeing what we could find out about them. Um, this is a, an iPad application which Sky have developed recently, um, absolutely beautifully done. We did a lot of the, the design work for it. Um, um, but it still does the same thing effectively as the Radio Times did 30 years ago. It's a linear schedule. Now, fair enough, that's our core product. Our core product is the EPG. That's how we see television. We are still in a world at the moment of linear broadcast television. Um, this is very much what our world looks like. Um, we've made it pretty. Um, we've kind of done some nice things where we can push marketing messages and that kind of stuff. But 
what if I found it wasn't was useful? So um, one of my developers is a, a chap called Greg Fleming, and I'm just going to um, pop up a very, very quick demo of a system that he built. Um, and what he wanted to do was look at data in a very, very different way. So this is a day's television. This is yesterday's television, in fact, um, of the top 40 channels. Um, uh, on, on, on our EPG. So you get to see immediately that there are kind of um, the usual suspects here. Um, but what we can do is this, is we can start looking at these things in very, very different views. Um, so this is just kind of done by time. Um, we can also do it by time and duration. And patterns start emerging. And the patterns that start emerging for me were really interesting because they were giving you information about television that you can't currently get through any other form uh, uh, you know, either anything that we do or, or as far as I know anything, anything else does. Um, so, you know, you get some obvious patterns right now. You can see quite clearly that um, children's programs are at the bottom. So these are uh, uh, short programs and movies are at the top here. You also get to see that we've got massive programs, big swathes of the schedule. So, tele shopping, um, uh, schedule filler. So, um, when we uh, start to look at this thing, we, we see these patterns emerging, and this gives us some really useful information. If I then separate this out by genre, um, again, you get to see the balance of programming, the balance of entertainment programming versus news programming versus documentary. The other thing you get to do, though, is you get to make filtering decisions. This is something that I desperately want in a product right now. There's a view here, which is by subgenre. Um, so this block here is children's programming. This is these, these light green blocks. And this block in particular is for under fives. Now, both my children are under two. I really just want to be able to take that and make that my own EPG for my kids. So I don't want them watching Ben 10 and stuff like that. You know, this is where in the night garden and whatever else lives. Um, we began to get silly with this as well, um, because silliness, I think, is a, a massively underrated thing when you're developing products. I like being silly. I like doing things that are stupid. I like doing things that make absolutely no sense, have no business uh, requirements whatsoever, are completely useless to all of you in the room right now. Um, so, you know, we just move the things into a radial uh, view there. Um, there's no point to this particularly, but it kind of proves a point to me a little bit, which is that Digital interfaces, by their nature, are dynamic. So why, going back to the wireframe idea again, why do we design things statically? It makes absolutely no sense to me, particularly new platforms like iPad, that we design and build things to only display one way. Um, uh, we can get even stupider on this. Um, the, this is a grid um, uh, of our TV listings by the first two letters um, of each program. So let me just give you an example. Makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Completely useless to everybody. But I like that. I like the fact that we can do that with this technology, that we can take a, a, a big bucket of content, a big bucket of information, which is effectively what an awful lot of media is going to end up becoming. And we can just filter it, mess around with it, throw it around the screen. And, and, and out of this, new paradigms for the interaction of that data will occur. I'm going to move on because some cool stuff I want to show you. So, so let's get really pointless now. Um, uh, pointless but fun, because this was another thing that, you know, we just weren't having enough fun, basically. Um, and what we wanted to do is start playing around with, um, uh, with, with toys, basically. So um, I bought the department and, uh, and Xbox Connect, which is sitting up on the shelf here. Um, when the Kinect first got released, um, I was very huh, meh about it. Will it work? Will it not? Yeah, it seemed okay. Some of the games were fun. About four days after it was released, somebody hacked the drivers and made them open source. And um, uh, literally, day by day, you were seeing new wonders appear in front of you on YouTube and Vimeo every single day. And this became a bit of a cause celebre for the, uh, for the development community. And it became something that was very, very, very fun to do. So we must now pray to the gods of stable code, because this is all beta. It's all hacked. I have no idea if it's going to work or not. I really hope. How am I doing for time? Five minutes. OK. So I really hope this works. So this is what uh, the Connect actually kind of puts out. Um, uh, this code is not mine, this is somebody else's. So we basically essentially have a normal RGB webcam, um, not massively high resolution, hopefully a firmware update soon is going to sort that. And then we have um, depth information. So the closer I am to it, 
the more solid it is. Um, so what we can do with this Kinect now is we can return the information of how objects look in 3D space. Um, the next thing that we can do, sorry, I'm going to be popping up and down all through this. And I desperately hope that it stays stable. Okay, so far, not so good. There we go. Um, the next thing that we can do is we can start recognizing shapes and patterns in it. Um, so I can stand here, and I don't know how this is going to work with the microphone, but we'll give it a go. If I assume the position. Oh, no. It's very, very fuzzy. Let me move forward a bit. There we go, that might be a bit better. There we go, right. So it's recognized my pose as the shape of a human. So now what it can do is it can actually track my skeleton. It knows where my joints are and what's going on here. Um, so, you know, this, uh, now suddenly we've got some information which is useful, some information that we can play with. Um, so, so then the next thing we're going to do, I did this for the kids earlier and they kind of lost their mind a bit, although it took me a few, actually let's do this one first because this is normally a bit more stable. Um, this again, this was done by the open source community largely. Um, this isn't necessarily original, so assume the position again. This, by the way, has become a standard gesture. I don't know why. Um, I think it's because it's the clearest indication of, is this going to work? Hold on, let me move forward. Is it tracking me? I'll give it one more go. If not, I'll move on to the next one. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. Right. So now it knows the position of my skeleton. It knows the position of my skeleton in 3D space. So what happens now is I have a torch. But I can now start waving around a real-time 3D environment. This environment, by the way, is built in the Unity open source 3D, uh, open source, sorry, uh, uh, free for non-commercial use uh, 3D engine, gaming engine. So now I have a stick here and I have a torch and I don't have much stage space, but I can effectively now walk around an environment. I can hopefully light a torch. Let's light another one. Okay, so um, this is kind of kind of cool, right? <laughs> right? Um, and we got so excited when we were doing this, you know, it was just like like uh, like, like being kids again. Um, the next thing that we, uh, uh, the next demo that we got all excited about was this chap also built in Unity, um, because if we know the skeletal form that we're looking at, well, then effectively we should be able to hopefully. And this one was very unstable earlier, but let's give it a go. No, it doesn't look like you're going to like it, are you? Oh, no. Hold on, try that again. Oh, no. Don't fall off the stage, Andy. OK. Rubbish. Right. Hence beta. OK. Let's move on to the next one very, very quickly. I'll uh, give a private demonstration later if anyone's interested. Don't worry, I'm married. OK. Um, <laughs> So that's not in the line of how to pick up girls. OK, so let's once again. Oh, 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 is it going to do it? OK, cool. Right, so I've got a skeleton. So I've got a skeleton. Let's just load in a bit of configuration information. So this is um, an application that a developer in my team called Jason Langdon did. And this is maybe where we start to get a bit more product focus and a bit more serious. Because now I've got this, I'm just going to put the mic down briefly, actually, if that's OK. Now I've got this, I can actually start to gesturally control what's going on because I know where my hands are. So I can start flicking around things. It looks like an interesting site. OK, let's shut that down. Back across. So binary report, anybody? Oh, I think it might have lost me. Um, this to me, oh, oh, here we go, yeah, fantastic, I'm back. Okay, it's still tracking me, it's gonna go nuts. Fantastic, so um, uh, this became fascinating to me because not only is it really, really cool, um, it also, um, let me switch this off before it <laughs> does my head in and yours. Um, so it, 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 it also, um, it, it was great for me for two reasons. Number one, um, that every single meeting that I've ever gone into that talks about gesture control on iPads or on Wii or any of that mentions the term minority report style interface. Oh dear, okay, I'm opening up all kinds of stuff here. Um, and it's like an obsession for product owners, man. That's all they want in the world is this you know, minority report style interface. Uh, I'm going to shut this down. Um, so, um, 
because I'm actually now, I think I'm actually now controlling my PC with it. Fantastic. <laughs> but that, uh, there you go, useful point. So um, some practical considerations here for perhaps for less able-bodied people, um, perhaps for uh, things where you don't have direct control of an interface behind a shop window or in something like that. There are actually practical implications of some of this work. Um, and uh, that was kind of fantastic. So um, the thing as well to bear in mind with that is that's, you know, that's not a commercial product. It's £120. It's a toy, effectively. Um, and yet you can achieve some amazing results with it. It's all free. It's all open source, all the software, all this code. Um, we actually built a bridge into Flash. Um, uh, so a bit of server middleware which translates the information into things that Flash can use. We managed to convert some of our applications to it. Um, it's silly, it's gratuitous, it's got absolutely nothing to do with the real world. You will probably never see a massively practical application using that. But it's really cool. And it makes you think about the changes in, in, in the way that people might relate to human computer interfaces. So this is the big question, why? Um, uh, by, by the way, my friend bet me that I couldn't get an orbital reference um, <laughs> in, so I win. Um, um, the, the web is burning, the web is changing, it's doing an awful lot of things. One thing that we found internally that these demonstrations did was cause a massive impact. People saw it and were like, oh my god, I thought you would just built websites. No? Okay, I, I can't just do a banner? No? All, all right, you were doing that kind of stuff as well. So this was amazing for you know, our own internal PR. Um, but also, we began to really very seriously look at, at changes in the paradigm. So uh, you saw my son earlier with an iPad, my slightly older son. He's um, uh, 21 months old, 16 months between them. <laughs> um, uh, my slightly older son um, uh, can't speak yet. He doesn't have uh, uh, command of, of language yet. Um, but he knows how to get into my bed, to pick an iPad up, to swipe it, to unlock it, to find iPlayer, and then Daddy puts on in the night garden. That's kind of amazing, right? 21 months old and he already knows that just from playing, just from messing around with it. I haven't taught him that, I haven't shown him where to put his finger. Just he's picked up because of the interaction of himself and the device and the feedback he's getting. That's not the most amazing thing. The most amazing thing for me is that now whenever he goes up to a TV or a laptop or any screen, he swipes it. <laughs> and that blew my mind, right? Because whatever people might tell you about UE, this is how things should be done, this is what a good user experience is. Um, that is what it is for us right now, but we have no idea where these things are going to go. I mean, perhaps we will end up with mind control, you know, I mean, very, very, very possible. Um, so I'm talking about the, uh, the earlier talk. Um, uh, so this kind of fascinates me. Um, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly because I think I'm going slightly over. But um, time is a problem. In the corporate environment, it's about product, about productivity, about getting things out. We run to very, very tight TX deadlines. Um, you know, we normally have something that we have to do tomorrow. Um, uh, you know, one of the things, ironically, whenever I talk about innovation and creativity to internal management is everyone brings up the Google 20%, this idea that, uh, that, that Google popularized about having 20% of your time for personal products, uh, personal projects rather. So um, that's fantastic completely not practical. However, talking to a couple of people that I know at Google, it seems to me that this isn't so much a case that Monday to Thursday you work on Google work and Friday you work on whatever else you want. It's more a culture. It's something that actually seeps into your organization. I don't tell my developers that I need their time cards filled from 9 o'clock to 5.30. And the thing that's fueled this change, really, has been picking up on this. Um, uh, really just conversations between people saying, I I've got this idea, or I saw this thing on the web, can you do it? Or have you ever thought about this? And, and those conversations, w when you get geeks like me together in a room, you know, these conversations kind of happen quite effortlessly. And really what you need to do is just do something about it. This is a very important principle for me when you're talking about that kind of creativity and that kind of um, uh, free-flowing, non-product-based thought. You are not a designer, you are not a developer, you are not your discipline. Whatever your discipline is, even if it's UE, even if it's business analysis or as a product owner or a business owner, um, you know, you are not your discipline when it comes to the free-flowing thinking uh, about uh, uh, pure ideas or pure creativity. Um, I'm going to finish on this. And I think that on balance, this might be actually my favorite image in the whole world. I was really pleased actually to see uh, Mr. Cooperman's uh, video on Lego earlier because I myself can now come out as a, as a Lego nerd. <laughs> um, best thing about having kids too. Um, um, 
I love this image so much. In fact, sometimes it almost makes me cry a bit. I think there's something so beautiful and pure in it um, that four blocks of plastic um, to a kid is a dinosaur. And I think secretly that's a dinosaur for most of us too.